Well, thanks for that introduction and for this opportunity to talk to you tonight. Um, the Graduate Student Award is on there because that was actually the result of a vote by the graduate students, so that's one that means a lot to me. And you can see here our building in downtown Baltimore. Many of you have probably driven past there. It's a great facility, a really good place to work. And uh, my aim now is to tell you about two areas in marine biotechnology where I think there are real important emerging opportunities. And both of these I will link to aspects of work in, in my own lab. So first of all, I'm going to discuss this old topic of drugs from the sea that's been around for decades and convince you that we are moving into a new era of drug discovery from marine sources. And then I'll spend just a few minutes on a completely different topic on marine microalgae and their potential for use in bioenergy. So to start with uh, drugs from the sea, there is an absolutely amazing diversity of compounds that have been discovered from marine sources. And it's actually an exciting time. Earlier this month, the census of marine life completed their first 10 years of study. And this got a lot of publicity at the time and showed even greater insights into the remarkable biodiversity in the marine environment. There are many drug classes from marine sources that are not found in terrestrial sources. So there's a lot of potential here. But the reality check is that after decades of work, there are only two drugs used in, in, in treatment of patients that derive from marine sources. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about m both of those. One other point that I want to make here is that there are many compounds in the clinical pipeline right now. Tom gave a great introduction to this process, and uh, these are at various stages. Most of these are anti-cancer drugs. You can see these are listed as coming from many different organisms, but when you drill down and look at them more carefully, the vast majority of them are likely to be of bacterial origin. So even if these compounds are found in marine invertebrates, these marine invertebrates have symbioses with a huge range of different bacteria, and these can be important in making the compounds of interest. And that's really important for a reason I'll come to in a minute. So the two drugs that have actually made it onto the market, the first of these was approved in 2004. It's a drug marketed under the name Prialt. It's gone under several other names previously. And this is a small peptide. It's derived from the cone shell. And you see a picture of a cone shell there. This is an, a very promising source for drug discovery. And there are several small biotech companies focused entirely on looking at the diversity of small peptides that come out of cone shells. The way these shells make their living is by hanging out on the bottom and waiting for a fish to swim past. And this small dart gets shot out into the fish, and it has an array of several hundred different bioactive peptides that are potent enough to instantly paralyze the fish, and it falls down next to the snail, and the snail proceeds to eat the fish. Now, these can be hazardous. One of these can um, inflict enough venom into a human to, to cause uh, deaths in humans as well, maybe 20 deaths over the last couple of decades. So this is an interesting source. I, I believe one of the reasons this drug has made it and got onto the market is because there was no supply issue. So once the peptide is identified, it can readily be synthesized. You don't have to worry about collecting cone shells and trying to purify the, the active ingredient. And this is key in moving forward many of these bioactive compounds from the marine environment. So Prialt is a really potent analgesic. It's been described as about a thousand times as potent as morphine, and it also has synergistic interactions with morphine. It's used typically in, in uh, terminal cancer patients or in very severe post-operative pain. So that's the first drug. The second one is approved for use only in the European Union at this point. 
This is an anti-cancer drug. It's marketed under the name Yondalus, and it's derived from a small tunicate from the Caribbean, shown in the picture there. The story here is interesting in terms of overcoming the supply problem that I've already mentioned a few times. So the early stages in the progression of this compound relied on collecting the tunicate from mangroves scattered around the Caribbean. And this took a, was a process that took about 10 years and really slowed down the development of this drug. The breakthrough came when a very similar compound was discovered from a bacterium, actually from a terrestrial bacterium. And that made it possible to make this compound exactly the same structure as derived from the tunicate by semi-synthesis, starting with a bacterial product and going through just 21 steps of organic synthesis. Many of these compounds are so complex that synthesis is really impossible or completely impractical. And that's another barrier to moving forward compounds from the marine environment. Now I want to tell you briefly, I think, the most striking story about a supply problem with a marine-derived compound. And this is the compound Halochondrin B. And the pure supply of Halochondrin B worldwide at the moment is 300 milligrams. So that came from a collection of one ton of a rare deep water sponge from New Zealand. So you get the idea. These are unbelievably potent compounds that can be present at very low concentrations. This is the only time, to my knowledge, that the National Institutes of Health have funded a survey in sponge ecology. And we know that on the planet we have 289 tons of the sponge. One ton was enough to give 300 milligrams, which moved this compound forward just a little way. And completely coincidentally, this afternoon I was given a press release from the company Esai that has had the interest in this compound for a long time. And this announces that earlier this week, the FDA have approved a synthetic analog based on this part of the molecule for use in treatment of patients with breast cancer. So this compound will go onto the market on the 26th of November. And it, it was fast-tracked. It's, it's a great success story. But you see, again, the reason this compound could move forward was that the supply problem could be overcome, in this case, by organic synthesis. So why does that affect the work that we do? Well, in many cases, we can overcome the supply problem by microbiology and molecular biology. And my lab is particularly interested in marine sponges. And one of many reviews here shows that many compounds from the marine environment that are novel and bioactive are sponge-derived. Well, why should that be? When you look at a typical sponge, and this is one we've worked on from the Great Barrier Reef, they are simply crammed full of bacteria. So many sponges, 50 or 60 percent of their biomass comes from symbiotic bacteria. They are more bacteria than sponge. So when you start discovering interesting compounds, there's a good chance that a whole lot of these are actually coming from the bacteria rather than from the invertebrate itself. And we've followed that line in several different projects, and one where we have a success story is this compound, manzamine A. This is a small alkaloid that has some promising anti-malarial activity and some other pharmaceutical activities. And we went and worked on the sponge that contains manzamine A that's found in a remote part of Indonesia. And after a whole lot of molecular studies and microbiology, we were fortunate enough to isolate the actinomycete that is responsible for the production of this compound. This means that the whole class of manzamines is more likely to move forward because pharmaceutical companies have very little interest in trying to collect marine invertebrates to move a class of compounds forward. As soon as you can tell them that there's the potential for sustainable supply, especially by fermentation, the compound, the class of compounds, receives more attention and is likely to move forward. And of course, this is the best part of my job. Uh, we do this microbiology in the field. So this is 
in the Bay of Banakan near Manado in Indonesia. It's one of the top five dive sites in the world. Um, I was fortunate enough to learn to dive on the Great Barrier Reef, and this blows away the Great Barrier Reef completely. So we've set up a field lab, dive. My graduate student here, Naomi, is collecting a piece of sponge, and we aim to be doing microbiology on that sponge within an hour of collecting it underwater. So we set up a field microbiology lab and of course freeze material for all our molecular analyses. So it's a great part of the job. One other reason why sponges are important is they are a resource for discovery of many novel bacteria. And the bioinformatic challenges here are actually immense, but uh, this is one of the systems where metagenomic approaches has its real limitations because sponges are so complex and have so many symbionts. We still put effort into culturing these symbionts and a lot of this is done in collaboration with pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies. And actinomycetes are of particular interest because about 70% of all bioactive compounds come from that particular group of, of bacteria. Okay, so now I want to change gear completely and tell you something about the opportunities in biofuels. And this is a complex figure, and I just want to run through a few points here. If you look down here, there are various sources that have been proposed as uh, uh, ways of obtaining economic biofuels. Red is bad, light colors are good. And you can see from corn being really bad in just about every parameter, including uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, use of high amounts of water, fertilizers, and energy. And the fact, this is an interesting column, this is the proportion of the agricultural land in the U.S. that would have to be devoted to making biofuels from these sources to meet 50% of our transportation needs. So that's a good figure to look at. And when you run down here, microalgae stand out as very promising in many of these criteria. There are still issues, including problems with harvest, but some very important advantages. And the reason we are focused on marine microalgae is you get around this problem of water requirements. And you're not um, in, in competition with drinking water or water that can be used for agriculture. So we are looking at various aspects of that. We are focused on a microalga called nanochloropsis for most of this work. The idea, of course, is that you can grow huge raceways of these microalgae and you are sequestering carbon dioxide potentially directly from power plants and you're using sunlight and photosynthesis to grow uh, material that can be over 50% by weight lipid content that is readily converted to biodiesel. So huge potential, but still some economic challenges. And with the microalgae, the harvesting is a particular challenge. So we're looking at various aspects of this, and we have a long history of growing microalgae because one of the other things our institute does is sustainable closed aquaculture systems where we feed fish larvae and the adult fish with microalgae to get away from using um, uh, fish oils from, the, from uh, bycatch. So we have a lot of expertise in growing these microalgae. The particular area that interests me uh, um, in this alga, nanochloropsis, that I already mentioned that's very fast growing, is the fact that they have many symbiotic bacteria associated with the microalgae. This hasn't been considered enough. If you want to do this on a huge scale and have stable cultures and optimize the growth and lipid production, you need also to be considering the symbiotic bacteria shown here in blue. And this has huge potential, but um, by understanding the whole system, we can move forward and overcome some of the economic challenges. This is an absolute boom area in biotechnology with many new companies starting up at the moment and a huge investment. And I just want to acknowledge many of the people in my group who've been involved in some of the work I've told you about and point out Matthew in particular. He's a technician who's been with me for many years until uh, 
July when he left me to join a small biotech company focused on producing ethanol from cyanobacteria. So this is a company in Florida and a real boom area for students interested in that. And my last comment is for those of you who are in the master's program and have been intrigued by biote marine biotechnology, I am teaching my class in marine biotechnology this coming spring. Thanks a lot. <laughs>